Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode six of season one of Race in Society, where we're focusing on the theme of race and COVID-19. My name is Alana Lenten, and today my co-host Zulika Zavalos is behind the scenes. We broadcast on our YouTube channel every two weeks, so please remember to subscribe to our channel to get all the updates of our upcoming sessions. In fact, we have only one upcoming session, but we hope to be doing further work uh, after this series on race and COVID. So today our theme is policing the quarantine. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on the unceded lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We acknowledge the unrelenting struggle, resilience and courage of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, led by the families of those whose lives have been taken from them to expose the injustices of colonialism, police and carceral systems. We recognize that non-Indigenous people have a responsibility to truth-telling and reparations to confront these injustices. The first colonial police force was established on unceded Gadigal land. Its primary role was to protect white people against Aboriginal people who were painted as unruly. Since then, policing the courts and prisons have been used to control the original owners of the lands of all so-called Australia. Since the 1991 Royal Commission into Aboriginal Debts and Custody alone, over 434 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have died in police cells and prisons. In September, yet another woman, Shirley Tilbaru, was found dead in a holding cell in the Brisbane Watch House. Our panel today will consider the ways in which we can learn from these ongoing struggles and the analysis of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to shed light on the use of the disproportionate police powers during the COVID-19 pandemic in Australia. As we heard in episode four, heavy-handed policing was deployed in response to the COVID outbreak in the nine Melbourne Tower blocks where residents are mainly Black, Brown and Asian. Fines have been administered more in suburbs where the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population or the migrant population is higher. But the same logics of colonial policing used for over 200 years are also affecting other groups at a time when a policing rather than a public health oriented response to the pandemic is being rolled out by state governments with the use of fines, lockdowns, curfews, and even prison sentences against those who are seen as failing to comply with COVID orders. So to help us to think through these topics, we have three extremely well-positioned uh, panelists joining us today. First, we go to Roxanne Moore. You are the Executive Officer of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services. Your organization has been shedding light on the ways in which Aboriginal people are being denied their rights during COVID-19. You've looked at the situation in prisons, as well as for children in out-of-home care, as well as the impact of policing in remote communities during COVID. So can you tell us how race impacts these policing dynamics and what can be done to increase the accountability? Thank you. Thanks for having me on the panel. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm coming from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and just paying my respect to elders past, present and those yet to come and to the other Aboriginal people on the panel and to um, other people living, listening in as well. Um, so I am a proud Noongar woman um, and the Executive Officer of NATSALS. Um, so we represent all the Aboriginal community controlled legal services um, in Australia. And the impacts of, of COVID-19 on our communities is really going to be felt for many years to come. And I think that our communities and, and our Aboriginal health organisations have been incredible in, in leading the way and been largely successful in keeping COVID out of our communities, but it's this heavy handed um, approach from governments across the country to policing the pandemic, which will leave serious scars. And I always think about the, the quote from um, Roxanne Gay, um, that eventually doctors will find a coronavirus vaccine, but black people will continue to wait for a cure for racism. And that's true here in Australia and, and racism is a pandemic that is killing our people, which we see in the high rates of um, deaths in custody, um, over 441 Aboriginal deaths in custody since 1991. 
Um, so during this pandemic, we, alongside families who've lost loved ones that have died in custody and over 400 academics and lawyers have repeatedly called for governments to responsibly release First Nations people and those most at risk from prison to reduce the prison population as the most effective way of managing the risk of COVID-19 outbreaks in prisons. Um, and our people make up 28% of the prison population, even though we're only 2% of the um, total population. And we are more vulnerable to contracting and, and dying from COVID-19 um, due to chronic health conditions and other legacy of colonisation. Um, and we see that there is this real risk of um, potential black deaths in custody from COVID-19. Um, and Despite all of this, um, you know, instead of decarceration, governments have opted for hard lockdown as their responses. And this means that kids, um, particularly in Victoria and Queensland um, in prison, have been subject to isolation in tiny concrete cells for weeks, which will cause lifelong damage. Um, and mob in prison more generally have been cut off from their families and supports. Um, that, that they usually have around them. And some have not even had access to soap or um, it, some prisons are actually forcing people inside to clean um, for COVID, putting them at further risk. Um, so instead of actually governments preventing people from entering the justice system during the pandemic, which is why we've been calling for a moratorium on executing warrants on low level offences, focusing on diversion, you know, keeping people out of prison. What we've seen is the opposite. Um, instead of a much needed health approach, a public health approach, we've seen this tough on crime policing the pandemic and the evidence shows that it's, it's black and brown people in this country who have been targeted by police with biosecurity offences. And police have been given unprecedented and emergency powers during this time. And the army has been sent into certain communities. And these powers are, you know, often um, broad, very discretionary, um, not clear lines of, um, uh, of reasoning provided. And the communication itself on the actual restrictions has been quite confusing for communities as well. And there's just a, a few examples of how we've seen COVID playing out for our people and, and other communities of colour. So um, mob in Tennant Creek, um, uh, they um, submitted complaints to Amnesty International um, around police attending houses which were known to be overcrowded and using COVID-19 um, regulations to order people to disperse or fining them um, where that wasn't possible. And this is clearly a systemic issue around housing. It's not a COVID um, issue, yet the biosecurity laws are being used in this way on our people. Um, there's also been clear examples of different rules for different classes and races when 3,000 people in public housing estates in North Melbourne and Flemington in Victoria were put in hard lockdown, essentially imprisoned in their homes with police out their front doors um, and denied access to basic human rights and needs when right across the road, apartments were subject to least restrictive measures. And there's you know, also clear evidence from New South Wales um, police data um, in terms of the more affluent areas like Wollara, Northern Beaches, um, where only 1.8% of fines have been issued, but 15% of COVID-19 infections. Whereas we saw the communities with lots of First Nations population and communities of color um, receiving the brunt of the COVID policing. And just the most recent example was um, on the 4th of September, which is like the height of the lockdown here in Nam in Melbourne, um, a Noongar man from um, Armadale was riding his bicycle to work at 5.30 a.m. He's an essential worker working on the Metro Rail Tunnel project. And he says he was uh, yelled at by police to walk his bike and then tackled to the ground called derogatory names and he ended up in hospital um, with a sling for his arm. He's now unable to work and they find him for not having a light on his bike. And I think we need to understand the uh, and contextualise policing in the history of our colonisation in Australia. And it has been and, and continues to be um, 
used against our people and to control our people. And back in the early days of colonization, it was police who were the ones who were removing our people from land and, and onto missions and, and removing children from families um, and enforcing those discriminatory, you know, stolen generation policies and, uh, and other um, policies. Um, which oppress our people. And so um, this continues to be an issue and this lack of accountability um, with the 400, 441 black deaths in custody since 1991, there hasn't been a single police officer who has been um, crim held criminally liable um, for any of these deaths. So this continues to be an issue and that's why we've been calling for um, during the pandemic, you know, independent oversight and Aboriginal oversight um, of these police powers and undertaking a comprehensive review of these COVID-19 police responses, um, as well as an independent analysis of the police stop data during the pandemic. And that state and territory um, governments are publicly reviewing the COVID-19 related infringements, mm -hmm. fines, directions, orders used by the police and the um, army during this time and ensuring that it is responsible and proportionate. And once and for all, we need to end police investigating police for there to be true accountability. Thank you for this really, um you know, well-rounded presentation, which links, I think, issues of not only prisons and policing, but also, you know, issues of housing, of really the effective, you know, placement of police within neighborhoods, within areas where racialized people are living. And I think that's a, an important part of the, the, the problem that often gets written out. We, we, we know about things that happen within institutions, but we fail often to think about the ways in which police um, <clears throat> control and, and govern and racially rule over the lives of people in the everyday. And when I say we, I mean white people generally who, who are not for the main part faced with the same levels of racialized policing. So, so thank you so much for this rich um, and very important overview. I'd like now to turn to uh, Megan Davis, who is Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous at the University of New South Wales and a professor of law. So the pandemic, as we've been hearing, has amplified issues of constitutional and human rights. And given that Aboriginal people are twice as likely to have a disability and they're at a higher risk uh, from COVID-19 infection, these issues are doubly amplified for Aboriginal people with disability. Uh, one human rights issue is outlined in the COVID-19 Statement of Concern, which call for the application of human rights principles and ethical decision-making in the management of the pandemic. <clears throat> and in a different example, the New South Wales police twice went to uh, the New South Wales Supreme Court to stop the Black Lives Matter uh, protests in Sydney. And they were successful the second time around. So what do you think Australians most urgently need to understand about the current state of constitutional rights, especially with regards to the racialized approach being taken to policing the pandemic and the protests that have been taking place at the same time. Thanks, Alana. Look, I think that um, I think the pandemic has really just amplified and highlighted the fact that we have very poor human rights protections in Australia. Um, and, and I don't think that that's well known because we are a high income nation and with a large percentage of the population who live in you know, relative affluent conditions compared to other parts of the world. Um, and so, and, and, and because we have, um, I suppose, a, a very lengthy dicey and trust in our, in our political representatives to do the right thing by us, and I think that's very imbued in our legal and political system, um, you know, there's been less, I suppose, understanding of most Australians of, of that really key structural weakness in that legal and political framework, and primarily because they haven't had to ever draw, draw upon it, right? Um, by and large, uh, most Australians live quite a peaceful existence. So it's not something that they've noticed as a deficit because it doesn't particularly involve them. Um, and so I think a really important point to make here, I mean, if you're looking at the protests and people talk about the implied right political communication. I mean, most constitutional lawyers accept that that um, isn't, um, uh, is, is poorly applied to this, to this context. 
Um, at the end of the day, we have very weak common law rights, human rights, protected human rights. We have very weak statutory rights because they're insecure, of course, because of parliamentary sovereignty. We have very, very poor implementation of international human rights law by the treaty bodies. They are scheduled to the Australian Human Rights Commission Act, but the Australian Human Rights Commission has become increasingly toothless over time and, in my view, have done a very poor job of human rights scrutiny of the government. They're practically silent this year. Um, they've done a very poor job in human rights education, and I know that's probably a very unpopular thing to say among the kind of political and human rights elite, but it's a fact. Um, and so in the absence of any of these this kind of framework coming into play, um, uh, th there's, not, there's not much there. It's very ad hoc, it's very piecemeal, and it certainly has driven a campaign for the past, you know, two or three decades among, you know, civil society groups and lawyers in Australia for a Charter of Rights or a Bill of Rights, but that's never been successful either. So I think um, if there's a, you know, a kind of something that Australians need to understand about the state of our constitutional rights, um, uh, from COVID and this pandemic, it is that we have very poor protections, which makes it very difficult um, to do direct translations or, or comparative analysis with the United States, because it's a completely different country with very different um, rights uh, recognition. Um, and the final point I suppose I'd make, um, kind of, I suppose, dovetailing off some of Roxy's comments, and that is around racism and Australia, I think it still is the case, you know, it is a very kind of, the, the treatment of Aboriginal people by the police is very racialized, there's a very lengthy history that you've touched upon. Um, but also our constitution is imbued by that same racial lens. Um, and there's all sorts of complexities as to why um, most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people don't want the race power in the constitution touched. But it is important for people to know that that power exists for the Commonwealth to pass racially um, uh, discriminatory laws that have an adverse or detrimental impact um, upon Aboriginal people and singles out Aboriginal people for different treatment. Um, that's unheard of really in, in all of the world. Um, and I suppose that's why out of the most recent constitutional reform process where people were arguing for a constitutional voice, which is a actual power to compel the state to have Aboriginal people at the table, um, and particularly the two key issues that were raised over two years of those constitutional dialogues was in the incarceration rate that Roxy's referred to, and the rate of um, child removals. Um, and so part of that desire to have some sort of structural voice, that means the government is mandated to have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at the table when they're making laws and policies, and that applies right across the Federation. Um, the, the, the whole purpose of that is to, is to talk to that gap, that rights gap that exists, um, because at the moment, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people don't have that place at the table, um, and we're not present in, in a lot, we, I mean, we're kind of present in law reform processes via submissions. We're present in terms of protests, but in terms of actually changing things and structurally being there, we're, we're not. Um, and, and that's one of the potentials of the constitution. There is nothing else in the system that can change that. That's my comment. Thank you. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that strikes me is a long-standing argument, at least for people like myself who do um, work on race, is about the tensions between human rights frameworks and race critical frameworks and whether or not human rights um, frameworks are actually fit for purpose for coping with dismantling race and race and racism. And that would be an amazing conversation to have at another time. Well, they're not, but we can have that conversation. Yes, I mean, you're exactly. right. I mean, the, the critique is correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and that's one of the, th and, and that's why I found it very important that you put on the table the criticisms of the of the Australian Human Rights Commission um, as one of the one of the thing, one of the areas in which um, improvement certainly needs to be made, and which this current crisis I really think shed, sheds light on. Um, thank you so much. Lastly, we turn to Dr. Vicky Sentas.
Um, Vicky, you are a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Law, also at the University of New South Wales. And in 2017, you published a report, really important report, on a secretive list that's held by the New South Wales Police, which targets Aboriginal people for increased police surveillance. Then in 2019, you also co-authored a study showing strip searches by New South Wales Police had increased by 46.8% within a four year period uh, between 2014 and 2018, which also obviously targets young Aboriginal people even when they don't have a criminal record. This year, it seems that social distancing fines are being similarly unevenly policed. So can you tell us why data collection is important in understanding racial profiling and police form and possible lessons uh, from you about the over-policing of racial minorities under this current uh, lockdown in the pandemic? Thank you. Thanks, Alana. Well, I guess it's always been in the state's interest to hide the operation and effect of its police forces. And on the other hand, it's always been in our interest by our, as a non-Indigenous um, person, I mean, anti-racist and in solidarity with self-determination movements to expose police practices in order to dismantle and transform those practices and systems. So that's why to me, data is important. Having access to system-wide state collected data and other evidence is just one small tool in a larger struggle um, in order to try and transform and dismantle these systems. I think it's important that no Australian jurisdiction routinely releases data on policing, let alone um, data on demographics and race. And so there's a lot of official data that we know around arrest and post arrest on criminal proceedings, but policing is made structurally invisible by the state. And there are a lot of reasons for that. So it's actually really hard to get police data. You need um, to FOI police. Police will often deliberately charge hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for that data. And then the information is incomplete. So why is data important for exposing racialized policing and racial profiling and also in the COVID context? So obviously the fuller picture has an impact on how we expose the truth of state power and what counts as solutions. So we know that routinely people of colour and First Nations are just not believed um, when they experience police violence and abuse of power. And with each repeated case of police violence, abuse of power um, and accountability that we hear time and time again, that somehow gets translated in public discourse as anomalies or bad apples or somehow unrelated to each other or other um, systems, broader systems of race and power. But if you compare it to say in the UK where the state mandates that there are compulsory quarterly police reports on ethnicity data of, say, stop and search, um, we say, see a slightly different public discourse because there's no denying the systemic truth of grossly disproportionate and racist policing. But in Australia, there is absolutely that denial that police target First Nations people um, and people of colour. So how does this relate to understanding and resisting racialised policing under lockdown? Now we heard from Roxanne a lot of what we do know, and we know the experience of First Nations people and other racialized people under COVID through people telling their stories, through media, through community organizations, through the work of the NATSILs, through other legal centers. And these stories all reflect um, what Megan and Roxanne have talked about, the amplification, the intensification of everyday colonial policing. We're talking about, you know, in addition to fines, unlawful stop and search, move on directions because people are in public space, even with a reasonable excuse. Um, and, you know, fines have certainly been in the spotlight. But what don't we know? So there's very little publicly available data on what practices actually make up COVID policing against who and why. Um, and Roxanne, I mentioned the call made by a network of community organisations and legal organisations under the banner of COVID Policing Australia, the full transparency and accountability of COVID policing through the regular release of system-wide 
data. Now, what is available has only been through the FOI requests of journalists um, and other advocates. And one really good example of how data re requests have been used to expose systemic over-policing is um, the work of the journalist Osman Faruqi and his um, early analysis of COVID enforcement uh, fines showed a huge disparity, um, you know, between you know, the, the poorest, um, you know, and, and migrant um, communities and where, you know, First Nations people live, um, you know, represent the largest amount of fines, but just a very small percentage of recorded COVID cases. So this is obviously about police targeting on the basis of race, class and geographic divisions and not around the alleged purpose of the Public Health Act to stop the spread um, of the pandemic. So we know a little bit about fines, but we don't know much about the other most common police actions during COVID. You know, that map onto the stories we've been hearing around move on directions and even searches, which just seems ridiculous. During a public health crisis that police are searching people, it makes absolutely no sense. So we don't have overall demographic statistics for who's being policed or, or how, and knowing this matters for what kind of demands we can make around police accountability. Thank you. And I think what, what I see there is a good link up between um, something that Megan said um, and what you're saying there around you know, the general public, the non-racialized, non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander public general belief that Australia is a de democratic space where you'll be treated fairly by the police, which ties in also with this lack of recognition, you know, despite the important articles that you mentioned by, by Faruqi and, and, and a minority of others, generally the media doesn't reflect the data. And so the general public is both you know, ignorant of the extent of racialized policing in Australia, but also doesn't have access to that information, both because of the difficulty, as you've expressed it, of getting the data out there, but also of the lack of coverage in the media. So I think that's kind of a perfect storm, which leads to this, you know, it's a kind of a, I'm thinking here of Charles Mills's work in terms of white ignorance, you know, and how that structures, um, you know, the lack, of, the lack of care for what's actually happening to so many people in our society. So thank you for that. Um, and finally, briefly to all three of you, could you share some tips perhaps that uh, you could give the public in order to how to think, uh, to think critically about racialized policing? So we'll go first to Roxanne, then Megan, and then Vicky, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think especially during this time, it's it's thinking really critically about how um, the media is portraying it and, and politicians as well. Like, I, I think it's a really important example about how the Black Lives Matter um, protest organisers have been treated during the pandemic, even though there hasn't been any evidence of um, community transmission um, and the um, actions of police. Um, at those protests, um, and I think um, it's about, um, you know, understanding why we still have to protest even during times like this, um, and it's because our people continue to die um, at, at the hands of the justice system. And um, I think it's also about understanding, you know, if these laws are meant to apply to everyone equally, um, well, why is it then being impacting on different communities and 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 mob differently? And how is colonisation impacted on that? And I think um, you know, educating yourself about you know, following black um, lawyers, uh, academics, um, journalists, writers, and and also. Um, uh, other uh, writers of colour as well. I think, um, you know, Osman, we've mentioned already, but Amy Maguire, um, uh, you know, Madeline Heyman Reba, Rachel Hocking, um, Megan, um, Alison Whitaker, Teela Reid, um, so many others, Vanessa Turnbull Roberts, Mariki Onis. I mean, there's so many. Um, and Natsal's changed the record. Yeah. Thank you. Megan. Oh, sorry. Um, I think, um, I mean, I think Roxy summed it up pretty well. I think um, it does help for people to read things that they wouldn't normally read and um, understand that there are ways in which media reports these issues, particularly issues relating to Aboriginal people, 
um, uh, compared to um, people outside of mainstream media. It's not, it's certainly not gospel, that's for sure. Um, but one thing I would um, also add to that is probably, um, you know, we know Australians have a pretty poor understanding of their own history. We know um, they don't really, you know, so many Australians don't even understand what the protection era was. I suspect they think it was an era of protecting Aboriginal people. Um, but, but we know that um, once the protection infrastructure was dismantled from state to state, um, virtually overnight, the protectors became police, right? So the rule of law goes from this kind of system of subjugation to this kind of principle or legal equality and this kind of, you know, concept of the rule of law that applies to all Australians. Um, except, you know, we wake up with all the scars of what that oppression and subjugation looks like. Um, and the police force has never really changed its kind of mindset when it thinks about who, who we are as peoples. Um, one of the greatest parts of the Royal Commission to Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, and this is, people think it's a complex report, it's actually really easy to read, um, but um, the, the, the state reports are really good. So when I did the Commission of Inquiry into Queensland's youth detention, I used this, the, the kind of regional reports to understand who these young people were that were in detention centres, like what, you know, where they come from, what's their family history, where's their country. And I think Australians would get a lot out of some of those reports. They're quite short, they're easy to read, they're well written. Um, and although they were written 30 years ago, they're really applicable today because obviously government's done nothing with the policy settings that were set out or the recommendations that were set out in the Royal Commission. So I think reading is really important, but I think that report really captures how the protection era kind of, there was this kind of seamless transition from that kind of compulsory racial segregation. That's Australian, right? It was our legal, it was our, our laws, our legislation, our statutes. Um, that seamless transition from that to, to what we have today. Um, people need to know that police don't have an unproblematized kind of attitude towards our people. They, they carry just as much baggage as we do, but in a different way. <laughs> Thank you. Finally, Vicky. Yeah, and if I was to think about just one thing about how to think critically about racialized policing, I would say that we often think of the problem as individual racist police. And of course, there are many, and all the baggage that Megan's talked about is, is critical and essential. But when we talk, think about whether an individual police officer is racist or not, it takes us down the path of, well, what are the solutions? Is it cultural awareness training? And many have said, no, that's not the solution. That's a failure. It doesn't address institutional racism. So I'd say when we say institutional racism, what, what can we look at and think about around policing? We need to look at law. You know, we th need to think about why offensive language and public drunkenness is still on the, on the statutes in many states. We need to look at the economy of policing. Why do police have key performance indicators for stop and search? And why does that lead to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people being you know, um, on the hit list for KPIs. So just, there are a couple of things to think about. Yes, racist individual police, it's, that's important, but institutional racism and what makes that up is, is important. Thank you to all three of you. I think that what that brings in is really the importance of what we would call racial literacy, which is about informing oneself about the history and also the continuation of these racist practices. But also, as you're saying there, Vicky, think about you know, what creates a racist individual? And, you know, the way you're laying it out for us there is the institution and the rules of that institution are what actually creates the opportunities for, in fact, they're doing their job by being racist. And I think that looking at it from that perspective is something that is rarely done because again, there's this widespread belief in the, you know, the general um, fairness of not only, sorry, not only of policing, but of Australian society in general. So I'd like to thank all three of uh, you today for taking the time to share your knowledge with us. And I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today. And please remember once again to like this video and to subscribe to our channel, not only for our last episode, but also for further, hopefully, um, episodes that we do. Please in, tune in to the next episode, which will be our final one in the series. And we're going to talk about the economic and social costs of the COVID-19 pandemic,
from the perspective of race. And we'll be joined by two panelists, San Mati Verma, who's a migrant rights activist and immigration lawyer with the United Workers Union and the Migrant Workers Center, and Sujata Fernandez, who's professor of sociology and professor of political economy at Sydney University. So thank you all.